turn in your Bibles, please, to Philippians chapter 2. And that would be on page 980 of your Bible. Philippians 2. Um, I'm going to be reading verses 1 through 18. So please, uh, follow along with me as I read your word uh, Philippians 2. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count the equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or questioning, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Joshua Bell emerged from the Metro and positioned himself against a wall beside a trash basket. By most measures, he was nondescript, a young white male in jeans, a long sleeve t-shirt, and a Washington Nationals baseball cap. From a small case, he removed a violin. Placing the open case at his feet, he shrewdly threw in a few dollars and pocket change as seed money and began to play. For the next 45 minutes in the DC Metro on January the 12th, 2007, Joshua Bell played Mozart and Schubert as over a thousand people streamed by, most hardly taking any notice. If they had paid attention, they might have recognized the young man for the world-renowned violinist that he is. They also might have noted that the violin he played, a rare Stradivarius, worth over three million dollars. Well, it was all a part of a project arranged by the Washington Post in a busy setting at an inconvenient time. Would beauty transcend? Would glory show through the mundane? Would busy people stop long enough to see that this violinist was much more than they had ever heard before? <laughs> Just three days earlier, Joshua Bell sold out Boston Symphony Hall with ordinary seats going for $100. In the subway, Bell garnered about $32 from the few people who stopped long enough to listen and to throw in their dollar bills. 
Does beauty transcend the mundane? Well, this is the story of what happened at Christmas. God visited planet Earth without fanfare. In great humility, he came wrapped in human skin in the person of Jesus. Would anyone know? Would anyone care? Would anyone stop long enough to see that he was more than they had ever seen before and just what their hungry hearts were searching for? We're going to look today at this wonderful passage on the incarnation of Jesus Christ. The theme I want to get across to you is this. Jesus Christ descended from the highest glory and experienced the lowest humiliation of crucifixion in order to save us. The text divides into three parts. There's the pre-existent Christ. There is the incarnate Jesus who came to earth. And there is the exalted Lord who ascended to glory and reigns as Lord. Another way to look at the passage is to consider the mindset of Jesus. What was going through his mind? Verses 6 through 8. We look also at the mindset of the Father in verses 9 through 11. How did he respond and receive the Lord Jesus back? And then we'll look at the text from the mindset of the believer, which is found in the front and the back of the passage. This great passage is given to show us, as his followers, how we are to think and live. Our great motive, you see, for service, for sacrifice, for humility, is found in Jesus Christ. The highest flights of theology that Paul can give us are there to show us how we are to live in the everyday stuff of life. Today I want to take up the first point from this bigger outline. What's the mindset of Jesus Christ? who laid aside his glory in heaven, took on human flesh, and suffered the indignities of the cross. Jesus, you see, is not climbing the ladder of success. He's going down. It's counterintuitive to everything we think about and want. There is no glory without suffering. There's no going up without coming down. There's no exaltation without humiliation. That was true of Jesus, and he's telling us that that is true of us as well. First thing I want you to see is the glory of Christ before his incarnation. We find that in verses 6 and 7. Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. This passage was probably first written as an early Christian hymn to be sung or a creed to be spoken. We don't know who wrote it, but it is incorporated and included by the Apostle Paul as the inspired word of God. The birth of Jesus in Bethlehem begins not in the manger in Bethlehem, but back in time and eternity. The baby who was born already existed in heaven with the Father. And this hymn of praise uses two words to describe his existence with the Father. And you see it there. The first word is the word morphe. He was in the form of God. Morphe indicates the essential being or nature of something. Now my morphe is that of a male human being. I was born that way and I always will be that. It never changes. The Greek word schema or schematic can be translated as form, but there's a difference. The schema is the external form. And so while my morphe never changes, my schema does, unfortunately. I go from infant, to teen, to young adult, to middle age, 
too old. I go from fair skin to whiskers. I go from skinny teenager to you finish it. <laughs> but the essential internal being never changes. Paul uses morphe to tell us that Jesus is God. He has the morphe of God, the eternal essence. What God is, Jesus is. And this is foundational to the Christian faith. You see, the nature of Jesus Christ as God has always been under attack. The Christian church has always come out on the right side of this issue in every generation with every attack. He is God. The heresies in the early church and the heresies of the cults today revolve around the nature of Jesus Christ. They say he was created and that he is something less than God. That is a lie from the pit. All the worship the Father received in heaven, the Son received. Jesus said before Abraham was, I am. In other words, he existed before Abraham, even though his birth in the manger was 1,500 years later. He is the eternal I am. The second word that is important here is the word translated equality. He did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. It's the word Isa, translated equality. Isometrics means equal measure. You kids who take geometry have learned by now that an isosceles triangle has three sides of equal length. So Jesus is God's equal. He could say, he that has seen me has seen the Father. Not as to his body, for God the Father has no body, but as to his essential nature. Hebrews chapter 1 says that he is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. He is equal with the Father in his nature. He is equal with the Father in his power and his glory. But the next thing we see is his attitude concerning this exalted position. What will he do with it? Well, the text says that he was willing to set it aside. Verse 6 says that this equality with God, this sharing of glory with the Father, was not something he had to hold on to. It was not something to be grasped. Now that does not mean that it was something that he did not have, but which he reached for. You see, that was the problem of Satan, a created angel who, who wanted to grasp for that which was not his to be equal with God. He grasped for something that was not his and he was punished for it. And this really is at the heart of what sin is. The problem we all have. We want to grasp as Adam and Eve did for something that was not theirs to take. They were told not to eat of a certain tree in the garden. And Satan said, no, 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 you will not surely die. If you eat of that tree, you will be like God. And that was what they wanted to do. And they grasped for what was not theirs. Sin is always grasping for what is not ours. Jesus, who held that equality with the Father, did not selfishly close his fist around it. He was willing to let go of it. And so the passage said he emptied himself. And what does that mean? Well, it means that he set aside the heavenly glory that he was accustomed to without losing his deity. Well, one translation says he did not hold on to the privileges he enjoyed. And that's a good way of putting it. The unhindered communion that he had with the Father in heaven was set aside when he crossed space and time to take on the likeness of men. C.S. Lewis puts it this way, lying at your feet is your dog. And imagine for a moment that your dog and every dog is in deep distress. 
Some of us love dogs very much. If it would help all the dogs in the world to become like men, would you be willing to become a dog? Would you put down your human nature? Would you leave your loved ones, your job, your hobbies, your art, your literature, and your music, and choose instead, instead of the intimate communion with your beloved, the poor substitute of looking into the beloved's face and wagging your tail, unable to smile or speak. Christ, by becoming man, limited the thing which to him was the most precious thing in the world, his unhampered, unhindered communion with the Father. That was the mind of Christ. To let go and to come down. And here's the second main point, the humanity and deity of Jesus at his birth. Verses 7 and 8. He emptied himself, he took the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death, on a cross. He added to his person a human nature without losing his divine nature. He added by subtraction. He let go to take on. Notice there are three words that are used to describe what he did in our verse. He took the form, he took the schemata of a servant. And you remember what I said about that. That's the external form of a man. He took on the changing, growing, physical and mental attributes of a human being. Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with, with God and man. The text says he was born in human likeness, shape, resemblance. He was found in human form. How many ways does he have to say it to tell us that he was a man? He could cry, feel pain, go hungry, experience joy and sorrow, grief, laughter. He could sing, he could sleep, and he would eat. And so we sing. He left his father's throne above, so free, so infinite his grace, emptied himself of all but love, and died for Adam's fallen race. He left the purity, the perfection, the worship, and the riches of heaven to come down. He's two natures in one person. The God-man, as someone put it, as much God as if he were never man, and as much man as if he were never God. The third point we find in the text is the humility of Jesus leading to his death. He became obedient to the point of death, even death, on a cross. Do you see the steps down he's taking? From heaven's throne, he loosens his grip on glory. He enters the world as an embryo, giving value and worth to the child in the womb. Until he is born, he takes on the life, not of a rich man, but of a common peasant. He suffers the hardships of human existence. The one to whom all obedience was given in glory now must be obedient to the will of his father. An obedience that gave him no other alternative than to die. He experiences, listen, he experiences the harsh realities of the end of life. He is like us in every way. Not only in birth, but in death. Something we all face as a result of sin. Only Jesus does not experience his death because he is a sinner. He is perfect. The disciples and all who knew him profess that he is the sinless son of God. Yet he came to bear all our sins on himself and suffer the cruel indignities of the cross. In other words, he did not just come to tell us about the peace of God and to preach the forgiveness of sins and offer us eternal life and then die 
peacefully in satin sheets surrounded by music and loved ones holding his hand. He died a cruel death. The death we deserve on a cross for our sins. The word cross or crucify in the Roman culture was a word so horrible that it was considered an obscenity. Could you imagine if I let loose with a string of obscenities from this pulpit? It would be my last Sunday here. And yet he became an obscenity for us. He's climbed all the way down the ladder from glory to sharing our humanity to dying on the cross and going down into the grave and experiencing there the very realities of hell and separation from his father. Why did he do that? Because you see, the Bible says there was no other way for us to be right with God. He did not spare his own son, but he offered him up for us all. The hymn writer says there was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only could unlock the gates of heaven to let us in. The hymn writer says bearing shame and scoffing rude. In my place condemned he stood. Ruined sinners like me and you to reclaim. Hallelujah. What a savior. The scholar William Henderson says in his commentary, while he was hanging on that cross, from below, Satan and all his hosts assailed him. From round about, men heaped scorn upon him. From above, God dropped upon him the power of darkness, symbol of the curse. And from, in, from within him, there arose that bitter cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Into this hell, the hell of Calvary, Christ descended. It is that infinitely long and steep staircase from God's throne to the hell of the cross that stands behind the story we celebrate this Christmas. I remember seeing a painting that was hung in the old sanctuary at Calvary when I was a kid. It was a, pic it was a painting of the, of the manger, but it didn't have three standing legs like this. They were crossed. And in the painting, there was an open window. And as the moonlight shone through the window, it cast down onto the manger, and the cross legs of the manger cast a shadow in the form of a cross on the floor. And the point was you can't look at the manger without seeing the cross. This is more than a tender, sweet little baby who comes to bring peace on earth. It is about a baby who could only accomplish peace through a cruel death for us. C.S. Lewis, in his book, Miracles, has a chapter entitled, The Grand Miracle. It's a chapter on the Incarnation. And in that chapter, he draws some rich analogies for us by which we can view the Incarnation, and he can say it far better than I. He says, in the Christian story, God descends in order to reascend. He comes down down from the heights of absolute being into time and space, down into humanity, down still further, down to the very roots and seabed of the nature he had created. But he goes down to come up again and bring the ruined world up with him. One has the picture of a strong man stooping lower and lower to get himself under some great heavy weight. And he disappears, but yet he lifts that 
weight, he straightens his back and marches off with the whole mass swaying on his shoulders. <laughs> or one may think of a diver first reducing himself to nakedness, then glancing in midair, then gone with a splash, vanished, rushing down through green and warm water into cold and black water, down through increasing pressure into the death-like region of ooze and slime and old decay. Then up again, back to color and light, his lungs almost bursting till suddenly he breaks surface again, holding in his hand the dripping precious thing he went down to recover. Hmm. Lewis has a way with words. Dear friends, we are that precious dripping thing that he came to rescue from the blackness and the slime and the ooze at the bottom. How far did he come down for us? Next week we're going to look at what the father does as a result of the son's obedience to go to the cross. The story is not over, hallelujah. But as we come to the Lord's Supper, we must remember that there is no exaltation without humiliation. And dear friends, in the darkest times you experience, when the pain is gripping your gut, and your head is throbbing, and your doubts are growing, when you are facing those serious times of humiliation and sadness, know that Jesus Christ stands by you and he says, I understand. You couldn't even possibly know how much I understand, for I experienced it too, in far greater ways. And there is a fellowship of suffering with the Lord Jesus Christ that brings us the great joy and comfort of life in the midst of our sorrows. May we once again confess these sins for which he died and offer ourselves in new obedience and thank him for so great a salvation that he would come to seek and to save the lost. Amen.